Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Ian Bogost. Hey there, everybody. How are you doing? So for the past five years or so, I've been working on applications of video games in journalism. And it's an area that I call news games. Um, and when I say news games, I really mean it as a term for any application of journalism in video game form. So it's a really broad definition. And I'm using such a broad definition purposefully. Um, it allows us to imagine all of the ways that games might do journalism, where the exact definitions of journalism and of games are really broad, open to considerable interpretation and disagreement. So this becomes like a whole kind of possibility space for uh, design and intervention. Uh, back in 2010, I published a book on this subject written with two of my PhD students at Georgia Tech called News Games, uh, developed uh, out of research funded by the Knight Foundation, which also supports Games for Change. And in that book, we described seven different areas or genres of news gaming, which are these, current events, infographics, documentary, puzzles, literacy, community, and platforms. And th this isn't meant to be a complete list, but the, the, the ones that occurred to us, a kind of diverse sampling of the most obvious, promising, initial areas of, of news games application in which we could find examples. And I'm not going to talk about all of these today. Instead, I want to focus on uh, a couple of them to give you some context for the project I really want to show you, which is a new approach to making journalistic games and indeed really any kind of game that we've been working on in my news games lab at Georgia Tech and with our collaborators at UC Santa Cruz. So I'm going to pick out two. Um, one of them is current event games. And what we mean by this are small, short form games that are created quickly. They're meant to comment upon or, or explain timely issues and events. And if you've seen little you know, web games that seem to deal with news, then they're probably current event games. Within this genre, we described three categories of current event game in the book, editorial, tabloid, and reportage, which roughly correspond with opinion, sensationalism, and explanation. Uh, so just to show you a couple of examples, you know, an editorial game is a game that does editorial, that offers commentary. Um, and these are often characterized by the same sort of, of critique and wry criticism and black comedy even that you see in opinion columns, in cartoons, in news satire, and in other kinds of commentary. This is one of my games from a few years ago, which puts the player in the role of a TSA agent trying to keep up with increasingly changing regulations which you can play in line at, uh, at the airport on your iPhone. And this is a selection of tabloid games. These are all very crude. They're often created very quickly. We have uh, So You Think You Can Drive Mel at the top left, which was you know, about Mel Gibson's uh, unfortunate uh, anti-Semitic drunken driving escapades. Uh, many Dick Cheney games back during the Bush administration, including this quail hunting game in which you're supposed to not shoot your hunting companions. We have um, Hothead Zidane, maybe the most famous tabloid game, which was uh, a crude uh, game about uh, Zidane and Matarazzi released within 24 hours of the 2006 World Cup final. Um, and then at the bottom right, uh, a very strange game by a French marketing agency about uh, the Octomom. So in, in any case, th these games are sensationalist, and they're, they're mostly looking to create uh, web traffic. They're link bait, essentially. Oh, there's a game about the Octomom? I'll go and look at it. Uh, and this is an example of what we call a reportage game. Uh, this is another one that I made at my studio that the New York Times published a number of years ago about the then current uh, debate uh, surrounding the McCain-Kennedy immigration legislation. And it was specifically about the, the then proposed uh, points-based green card award program. So those are some examples of current event games, you know, fairly diverse examples. Uh, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about puzzles, which is the second genre that relates to the, uh, the new work I want to show. If you think about the puzzle, actually the news has a, a century-long history of providing puzzles, uh, particularly in the form of the crossword puzzle. And a puzzle or a quiz may not carry news content, but they do something else. They lead readers to that content, or, or they provide an incentive for readers to procure a paper in the first place. And in, in that respect, the, the newspaper puzzle relates very directly to practices of news readership in ways that we, we may not have noticed. When the print newspaper was king and we didn't have any other choice, 
then the crossword provided a ritual practice. You, you did the puzzle to kind of warm up for the day. It, it gave you a sense of mastery and a sense of predictability in an unpredictable world. And in that respect, the crossword is not just this incidental part of the paper, the kind of throwaway part of the paper, but a primary entry point, one of the ways in which people find their way into the news. There are others too, right? The comics, the opinion page, the sports page. And then once you've looked at those primary entry points, once you've entered the paper through them, you happen to have the rest of the news nearby, so you might as well read some of it. Now there have been attempts to translate some of this practice of puzzle making in digital form. Uh, this is a, a game called Scoop that uses RSS feeds to generate crossword style casual puzzles which link to related stories. So it's always drawing in new material and, and taking some of that idea of the puzzle bringing you to the news content uh, seriously. Uh, but with few exceptions, among them uh, the Telegraph in the UK which has a whole site devoted to original puzzles. Despite that, the newspaper uh, business has essentially missed the fact that the casual and social game marketplaces are essentially the progeny of the newspaper puzzle. And it, it's no secret that those are markets worth several billions of dollars a year now. It's a kind of blind spot that might remind you of the ways that uh, the newspaper business also missed the emergence of online person-to-person -person sales in the 1990s, uh, eBay and Craigslist and so forth. Uh, and now we see the ways in which you know, Facebook and Groupon and other kinds of services have superseded the classifieds as the most effective way to sell local goods and services. So there's, there's a reason to pay attention to these seemingly incidental lessons because they may be more central to the practice of news than we previously thought. So in, uh, in our lab, one of the things we've done with this, uh, with this, this news game genre model <laughs> is to use it as a kind of design space to ask questions about what kinds of news games might be made by looking at these models and then imagining different intersections of them. Um, I was a particular, particularly interested in current event and puzzle games, partly because they were both the most prevalent current event games and puzzles maybe the least explored. And they also seem to have a kind of relationship to one another that we might want to exploit further. And if you think about it, the editorial cartoon actually has a similar function to the newspaper puzzle. And sometimes we use the editorial cartoon as a model for current event news games, especially editorial games. They're a lot like a current, uh, an editorial cartoon. They invite a reader into a story or an issue and then, and then kind of cash out that curiosity very quickly. Uh, in maybe in material uh, that follows, they can read more deeply after they've looked at this issue and been invited into it in a kind of, a kind of familiar way. Then at the same time, newspapers um, are you know, going away, and in particular, the smaller local newspapers through which most people got their local news have been particularly hard hit by the economic downturn in the news business and in general. And as these newspapers have been disappearing, before they do so, one of the ways they've attempted to reduce costs or you know, eliminating seemingly extraneous desks and, and, uh, and infrastructure and regular columnists are one example, but the local editorial cartoonist is, a, is another example of a desk that's all but been eliminated in, in the local news. What this means is that uh, the, the track record of the editorial or the cartoon or the puzzle as a mechanism for drawing in readers and giving them a reason to enter the news, the local news in particular, in the first place, that practice has been sort of cut off at the knees. And now you're just expected to come to the news on your own or to find it through social media where someone might link to it and then you would follow up. And then with the move to online distribution in the local news, um, these newspapers have not, have not kind of reinvented those forums in, in, in a digital format. So if you, if you take seriously the idea that the editorial cartoon serves as a hidden entryway into the news, particularly into local news, then if you, if you remove that entrance, then it's much harder to get readers into the news content itself. And this is a conclusion that differs uh, fairly substantially from the common opinion about the problem that local news faces, namely that it's merely an effect of the decline of, of mass media in favor of the internet. So you know the print newspaper is supposed to go away. Now that may be true, we may see ourselves moving to a digital format for the delivery of news, uh, but at the same time, structures within the news media themselves may be accelerating 
or, or even catalyzing those shifts. And at any, at any rate, the local news organizations uh, uh, are not reinventing the form of the editorial cartoon or the puzzle as entry point into the news for their digital editions. They're just sort of putting their, their news content up. Okay, now at the same time, if we kind of, kind of switch gears again, when you think about the practice of making these news games, there's a problem with creation. And it's a problem that affects all of these genres of news games, but of current event games in particular, and that's because current event games have to be made really rapidly. So making games is really, really difficult under the best of circumstances. Making games among journalists who aren't trained as game designers and computer programmers is even harder. One approach to this challenge is to create computationally proficient journalists, people who both understand the news and the values of journalism and also the practice of, uh, of digital media. And that's, in, that's underway and it will continue to develop and it's a good idea. But even, even in the case where you have someone who is uh, particularly uh, fluent with the computer as a creative tool, uh, creating a game quickly enough that it could be construed as a current event game, that it could be responsive to a recent event and be published fast enough to still be relevant uh, is very, very difficult. So we, we saw those examples of tabloid games, and you know, those were created really quickly. They're pretty crappy games. But uh, even the examples of more sophisticated current event games are still perhaps taking you know, a week or two to create with a small team. And that may not be a sustainable model for, uh, for that genre. Now, if you're familiar with some of the new tools that have been made available over the past five or 10 years in game design and game development, there are lots of attempts to make that development process easier. We have things like Game Maker and Adventure Game Studio, which don't require as much programming expertise. Uh, but they still assume a knowledge of game design. So you may not have to write code, you can kind of connect you know, different elements and tell the, the system how it's supposed to make them behave. But you do have to have enough game design literacy that you would know what kind of behaviors you want in the first place. These tools are asking the, uh, the creator to work at the mechanical level. That is, to work at the level of telling the software how the game should work and what behaviors it should have which still demands that you understand something about how games should work, what makes a good game, or even what, just what makes a game that's playable. And what we really want instead of this to work with news games quickly is a tool that allows a creator to work at the ideational level. That you could say, I want a game that's about X. And then the, the tool will facilitate the process of making a game about X rather than one that has ABC features. Now, a few years back in, uh, in the games industry, there was this craze for user-generated content back when that was the buzzword. And it fizzled out relatively quickly and gave way to the rise of Facebook and social games. But there were a number of attempts uh, to do this. We had uh, systems like MetaPlace and Sims Carnival and uh, Popfly. And, and all of these tools made it easier for ordinary people to make games. I think they were still operating at that mechanical level too much. Uh, but there were at least a wider variety of them. Unfortunately, most of these experiments were shuttered, and because they were all proprietary and run by games organizations, uh, you couldn't get your content out again. So the, all of this is kind of lost to history. Now, if you compare that situation, that development situation, with the idea of another medium like photography, you think about the difference, right? The camera is a powerful tool and a widespread tool, and the photograph is something that's used for lots of different purposes, not just because it can make art or educational products, but because it can be used for so many different purposes and because people know how to use it and they know how to interpret the results. Now, photography has an advantage that, that games may never have, and that's that a camera is this box that you point at the world and you push a button and it spits out a photograph. And we don't have an equivalent like that for games. We don't have a kind of game camera that you point at the world and then you push a button and piece of software comes out the other end that you can play, and it's about the situation that was presented before the, the image. Um, so a couple years ago, uh, Michael Matias and I decided, oh, we can make that. That's no problem. And uh, we managed to get uh, the Knight Foundation to give us another grant in 2010 as part of the, the News Challenge program to make an authoring tool for cartoon-like current event games that would, that would serve that purpose of providing an entry point, right, that would be used on a local newspaper or broadcast websites as an entry point into uh, regular, uh, regular current events uh, at the local level. Uh, and we knew a few things about this system 
going in that we wanted it to do. We knew that, that we, we needed to take seriously this lesson of, of authoring at the level of meaning rather than the level of mechanics. And so we started breaking down classic, simple arcade and console games into these little atoms, these little chunks of gameplay that you find in simple games. And that those would sort of live under the surface and we would let the journalist create a game by making meaning at the, at the level of ideas and the mechanics would sort of fall into place. We would interpret the meaning that the author presented and, uh, and then we would translate it into a functioning playable game. Easy, right? No problem. <laughs> So we worked on this problem for about a year of trying to figure out exactly what, what it meant to author a game in that fashion. And eventually, we had, we had started the pro this process by, by making concept maps of different news stories as a way of trying to understand how we as human readers could uh, try to make sense of the different patterns in, uh, in news stories. And we were using this concept map type tool, which is you know, just a diagram for showing the relationships among concepts. They're commonly used for brainstorming, outlining, and so forth. And, and we realized one day, wait, what if we just use the concept map paradigm as the authoring system? This is how you would author a game, is by describing the relationships between entities. Uh, and so we implemented that. And the idea is that once the author has indicated the subjects, the nouns, and the relationships, or the verbs, within the story that they want to tell, then our system uh, makes sense of that network uh, via this uh, fairly crazy artificial intelligence system that's capable of doing simple but somewhat convincing reasoning about game design and it spits out immediately a, a current event game that you can then uh, skin and download and put in a web page or what have you. Uh, and we, we call this thing Gamomatic uh, because it's a machine for, for making games and I'm going to do the very foolhardy thing of, of doing a live demo of it. <laughs> Okay, so this is, this is what the system looks like. Uh, so, you know, so far so good. You, you get this concept map idea. And uh, okay, I, I see that you're not seeing what I'm seeing. <laughs> we go, there we go. They're, they're uh, very eager for, for you not to see the guts of my computer. Um, all right, so this is, this is the concept map authoring system. We can, we can say, um, we can make a game about anything we want, but uh, you know, I went and I looked for some stories that we might, we might be able to, to develop a game about, with things that are going on. So there's this, um, you know, there's this uh, uh, wildfire uh, fight that's been going on in, uh, in the Southwest, in Colorado, in New Mexico, and so forth. And this wouldn't be the kind of thing that you would normally you know, sit down and spend a week making a game about, but you know, maybe we could make a quick game about it. So one of the issues that's going on with uh, these Colorado wildfires um, is that uh, we have weather, you know, wind uh, effects that are growing uh, the fires. We, we know that the fires are destroying homes, which is tragic, and we might want to include that in our game. So all I'm doing is I am uh, selecting these nouns, which I describe arbitrarily, and then there's a bunch of verbs that are built into the system that I can use to describe relationships between them. And then we have uh, firefighters. And uh, the firefighters are um, absorb, I will say attacking uh, the fire. That seems to make sense. But the weather is also um, holding back the firefighters. It's delaying their, uh, their ability to get to the fires even as it's growing them. So that's what I want my game to be about, is this relationship between entities. And I press this big button, and at least in theory, like I've never seen this game before, so uh, it may or may not work. Um, we have the firefighters game, um, in which I am supposed to get the firefighters to the, uh, to the, to the right side of the screen, um, and I have to protect, okay, protect the, the homes from Colorado fires. Okay, let's see. So I have these, these firefighters that presumably I'm trying to, the fires are, Okay, that wasn't a very interesting game, right? <laughs> but I won. But, you know, it, it wasn't a very interesting game that I made in one second. So we can just get another game, it doesn't matter. Um, so now I'm the, I'm the Colorado Fires, and I'm trying to collect the homes, right? So I'm trying to destroy the homes playing as the, as the Colorado, okay, let's see. So the firefighters are in my way, and now I'm stuck on the firefighters. <laughs> Oops, I, I accidentally paused the game. Yeah, but the, the fires are growing, and, 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 but, but the firefighters have like contained me. Okay, so, so we, you know, this may or may not be an interesting game. <laughs> we can get another one. Um, I, I, I failed to read. The, uh, I control the Colorado fires, and I, I have to remove all the homes from the screen. Okay, let's see here. Okay, this, this, is, this is working a lot better. So now I'm, 
Now I'm just trying to destroy all the homes. Okay, so you, you, that may not be the game you want to make, right? But it's no problem. You just generate a new one, and then um, and then when I'm ready, I can I can actually just go in here and uh, and customize it, right? So I've got all of these different skins that I can use, you know. So I can take the homes, and I have a, I have an icon, or you can upload um, your own images. Um, so we'll come back to that. But first, let's uh, let's actually make another game. Oops. Uh, so here's another thing that's been going on, right, is this, this whole Bloomberg soda thing, which is kind of interesting. Um, so let's try to make a game about that. Um, Bloomberg. <coughs> the first game with Bloomberg in it. Um, so we know that, we know that Bloomberg, um, is, he doesn't like large sodas. <laughs> Uh, and then, you know, we have this obesity problem, and I, I guess, I guess the, the assumption is that large sodas um, grow obesity. Okay, so like that might be enough for a game. Um, let's see what happens. Um, okay, move, move the, the sodas. I'm trying to get the sodas. Okay, sodas are, are totally safe from Bloomberg in this game. <laughs> let's try another one. Oh, now we have Bloomberg trying to... Uh, to contain all of the sodas, and I, you know, I could go ahead and I could go ahead and skin this. We've got, let's see, if, I don't have Bloomberg in here, but I have probably maybe that's Bloomberg, and we, we'd have to we'd have to find our own soda um, skin. But I just want you to see we'll make the uh, we'll make those sodas. <laughs> Obesity. This is tough, right? Uh, these are these abstract ideas. Which one do you like? Oh, someone, someone likes the elephant. That's, that's editorial right there. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll just use this big cloud. And, um, and then, you know, I get these, this is sort of very strange, I can turn off these labels too if I want to. And I get these, these very strange, like almost cartoon looking things. I can also um, download this, this is a zip file with the game in it and upload it. I can embed it in a website. I can share it on Facebook and do all that sort of thing. Um, and we can just make another game immediately if we want to. Let's make one more. Um, see if I can clear all this. So one of the interesting things about this system is that um, even though it's designed or conceived with the idea of making news games, we can really make a game about just, just about anything um, we want. Uh, so, like, I don't know, I thought of this idea backstage. Um, you know, maybe the, a New Yorker needs a taxi, but the, the taxi avoids the New Yorker. <laughs> you know, that, that's kind of enough to get a game out of. Um, okay, so I'm trying to get the taxi, and I'm, I'm shrinking, and, but it's avoiding me. So I'm controlling the New Yorker. He's gone now. There he is. Oh, I almost caught it. Yes. That's, 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 that's uh, an interesting game. <laughs> there, was, there was one earlier of, okay, trying to get the New Yorkers to their destination without being uh, thrown around by the taxi. Um, I don't like that one. Survive, okay. Um, the New Yorker is presumably supposed to get the taxi so he doesn't shrink to nothing, but the taxi is avoiding him. And, you know, once again, I can go in here and I can either, uh, I can either use um, the... Uh, the built-in uh, art that we've provided, or we can, uh, you can upload your own stuff and really turn it into, into the skin that you would like. Okay, so <laughs> that's the basics of the game o -matic system. All right, so the, the interesting thing about this project is that it's not a game, it's a piece of infrastructure. And that, as a piece of infrastructure, it can uh, kind of take on a life of its own. And it may be used for journalism, which was one of the first cases that we're going to try to test it for. We're going to release the beta later this month. But we hope and anticipate that people like you and all of the random people on the internet uh, will use it for all sorts of other crazy things. So the game o system is probably never going to be like the Kodak Brownie. We, we may not ever have a tool commensurate with the point-and-shoot camera for game development, but the game o system inches a little bit closer to that idea of a game camera. And in any case, it's a totally different paradigm 
for game authoring, one where you're, you're making a game very rapidly, you have to get used to the idea that you're not really in control, you're more like a puppeteer, and you're, t you're describing what a game is about, and then the system is attempting to kind of match uh, the way that that game uh, works. And it does this partly by making, you know, kind of bad games, just like a point-and-shoot camera makes bad photographs. <laughs> but it's not a criticism to call the photographs or the games bad in this case. Really, that is one of the ways that we spread a practice, is by, by putting tools like this in the hands of everybody and then seeing exactly what we should use them for and how they're best used. So, you know, we have this tagline, simple games quickly, as a way of, uh, you know, attempting to, to synthesize that idea. Uh, and it can be used for, for news and journalism. It can be used for any other applications that are relevant for this con conference. But it could also just be used to make a, a game about your cats or your house or your family or whatever you'd like. Uh, I hope you'll uh, go to gamomatic.com and uh, sign up for the beta. It's free. The whole system's open sourced as well. We'll be releasing it uh, in beta form uh, at the end of this month, I hope, and then in, uh, in final form in September. This is the team that's involved, and thanks again to Games for Change and to the, to the Knight Foundation, of course, for their ongoing support.